This is Duke University. Okay, thank you Malachi and thank you all for coming today. It's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. I did my PhD here at Duke, so um, it's, uh, it's nice to be home. In 2011, philosopher Richard Bernstein wrote the following. Schmidt's work is actively and passionately discussed throughout the world. He has been hailed as the most incisive, relevant, and controversial political and legal theorist of the 20th century. And the enthusiasm for Schmidt is shared by thinkers across the political spectrum, from the extreme left to the extreme right. Now, a quarter century ago, the Western left was deeply averse to the appropriation of ideas from Schmidt. Today, by contrast, the left's spectrum of responses ranges from aversion to appropriation. And this raises the questions, how to approach a so-called master thinker of political theory who is at the same time a representative of Germany's unmastered past? Can a political thinker be both intellectual friend and political enemy? To what extent does a contextual reading of Schmidt circumscribe, uh, circumscribe the, theory's, uh, the theory's meanings and thereby limit its utility for progressive theorizing? In my very limited time today, I will provide an introductory glimpse of three political theorists who both identify as leftists and have devoted years of their lives to explicating Schmidt's texts. Gopal Balakrishnan, Andres Kalevas, and Chantal Mouffe. This 21st, gen gen 21st century generation of left Schmidtians believe they can, Schmidt, they can <laughs> sorry, uh, believe they can separate Schmidt's insights from his intentions, rescuing the classic status of the former from the contingent failures of Schmidt's own political judgment. And I argue that the salvage operations performed by these thinkers fail to deliver on this promise for two reasons, either because they underestimate the extent to which the contexts of German history circumscribe these texts' possible meanings, or by refashioning Schmidt into a theorist of class struggle, extraordinary democratic politics, or pluralism, so dilute Schmidt's meanings that the resulting syntheses cannot be considered Schmidtian. So who was Carl Schmidt? Carl Schmidt died in 1985 at the age of 96. Uh, Nazis tend to live a long time. Uh, born in 1888 to a Catholic family, he was educated as a lawyer, received his habilitation at Strasbourg, then part of Germany in 1915, and spent the rest of Weimar teaching at universities and schools of business administration in Munich, Greifswald, Bonn, and Berlin. His experience of the two Soviet republics in Munich 1919 left a permanent impression uh, as a civil servant who saw revolutionaries enter his office and shoot an officer beside his desk. Uh, the right-wing paramilitary Fry Corps appeared to him as saviors of the middle classes from Bolshevism. The early works, political romanticism and dictatorship, were products of his Munich period. His Bonn years from 1921 to 1928 were his most productive, and today's most cited works, political theology, the crisis of parliamentary democracy, constitutional theory, and the concept of the political were all composed in these years. These are the works that made his interwar European reputation as a trenchant anti-liberal jurist, constitutional, and political thinker. They drew the attention of left and liberal thinkers at the time, it is true, though many later regretted the liaison, and that leftists found insights in the right-wing thinker then needn't serve as a recommendation that we try the same. If Schmidt appeared then and now to exceed in intellectual quality the average conservative revolutionary in Germany, he can still, in the final analysis, be located on the right wing of the mid-20th century European political spectrum. And this was very legible at the time, as in his 1925 assessments of Mussolini, who in his view represented the redemption of decadent liberal parliamentarism by the authentic politics of the strong leader. Um, in the crisis of parliamentary democracy, Schmidt argued that liberal democracy was an incoherent synthesis 
of the logics of liberalism and democracy. Liberalism's theory of representation and, deliber and deliberation uh, uh, was discredited by the development of modern mass democracy, quote, which has made argumentative public discussion an empty formality, unquote. Democracy, which he claimed to value, could therefore be decoupled from liberalism on the grounds that a combination of plebiscitary acclamation and Caesaristic dictatorship could, quote, express the will of the people just as well and perhaps better than through the statistical apparatus, voting, that has been constructed with such meticulousness in the last 50 years. For Schmidt, democracy's key premise was the identity of ruler and ruled, an outcome better achieved through social homogeneity and a strong political executive than the pluralism of parliament and parties. As he wrote, a democracy demonstrates its power by knowing how to refuse or keep at bay something foreign and unequal that threatens its homogeneity. Now, Schmidt's treatise on the concept of the political from 1927 continues the critique of liberalism, but, but at a higher level of abstraction. Uh, Schmidt believed that liberal constitutionalism had no authentic substance, only negative mechanisms for controlling or separating power. As he writes, liberalism, quote, in a very systematic fashion, negates or evades the political. There exists no liberal politics, only a liberal critique of politics. What he means is that technological and economic progress should not obscure the nature of the political sphere. Being political means being able to recognize threats to the existence of the state. And since in the extreme case, the defense of the state involves physical killing, Schmidt makes of this extremity the defining criterion of the political. As he famously wrote, the specific distinction to which political actions and motives can be reduced is that between friend and enemy. The friend, enemy, and combat concepts receive their real meaning precisely because they refer to the real possibility of physical killing. So the problem with liberalism is that it denies the existence of true mortal enemies. Quote, liberalism has attempted to transform the enemy into a competitor from the viewpoint of economics and from the intellectual point of view into a debating adversary. As he elaborated in a 1929 essay, quote, the preponderance of fascism over economic interests signifies the heroic effort to maintain and preserve the dignity of the state and of national unity vis-a-vis -vis the pluralism of economic interests. Now, written in the brief parenthesis that was Weimar's stable middle years, Schmitt's, Schmitt's political existentialism offered no respite to the republic. Quote, only the actual participants can correctly recognize, understand, and judge whether the adversary intends to negate his opponent's way of life and therefore must be repulsed or fought in order to preserve one's, one's own form of existence. Now, as Weimar entered its terminal decline in 1930, Schmidt associated himself with intellectuals who sought to revise the Republican Constitution in a more authoritarian direction, as well as statesmen who were pursuing that goal, Johannes Poppitz, Franz von Papen, and Kurt Schleicher. On the basis of these connections and his writings, which favored an expansive interpretation of the emergency powers of the president codified in the Constitution's Article 48. Schmidt was selected to represent the Reich before the Constitutional Court in the case of the so-called Prussian coup uh, of 1932. In, and very briefly, while the Social Democrat-led coalition in Prussia sought to restrict Nazi activities, von Papen sought to lift the ban on Nazi formations and as a consequence, von Papen placed Prussia under martial law, removed the Prussian government, and then turned to Schmidt to argue his case. While some scholars contend 
that Schmidt was not an opponent of the Weimar Constitution, Schmidt's role in the Prussia coup of 1932 illustrates his lack of a commitment to pluralism, at the very least. As one scholar summarized, quote, in the crisis of Weimar, he was not looking for a way to strengthen democratic forces against anti-constitutional ones. Rather, he proposed a solution favored by circles that had despised the Weimar constitutional system from the very beginning. And just a few more words on uh, Schmidt's biography before I turn to uh, sort of the history of his reception. Hitler assumed the chancellorship in January 1933. In March, Schmidt helped draft a law intended to empower Hitler to appoint commissars for the federal states. In May 1933, he joined the Nazi party, the same month as philosopher Martin Heidegger. A chair at the most renowned university in the country at Berlin followed. In November, he became president of the National Socialist Jurists Association. And in June 1934, editor-in-chief of the leading law journal. From 1934 to 1936, Schmidt wrote about 40 articles supporting the restructuring of the legal system in both legal journals and regular newspapers. And in October 1936, organized a conference on, quote, Judaism in German jurisprudence. This conference resulted in proposals for specific remedial action, such as the omission in future legal writings of references to Jewish authors whenever possible, and warning designations with those, when those, with those citations which were unavoidable. A six-volume set of studies of Jewish influence in the branches of German legal literature followed. Uh, now, despite all this, he was outmaneuvered by figures in the SS who viewed him as too attached to Catholicism, and he was removed from his position uh, with the Jurists', Jurists Association and as well as his edit editorial position. Uh, but to call this the fall of Carl Schmidt, uh, this was a very soft fall. He retained his chair at the university, his title of Prussian State Counselor, and in 1939, he rebounded Winning, winning the Fuhrer's ear as a theorist of international law and apologist for Nazi empire in Europe. With his Grossraum or Greater Spaces theory, Schmidt claimed the center of Europe for Germany and drew on the precedent he believed was set by the United States with its Monroe Doctrine. Just weeks after Schmidt presented these ideas, in March 1939, Hitler brought up the same idea in a Reichstag speech. Though the theory lacked the racial component of the Nazi theory of Lebensraum, Schmidt's claim from the dock at Nuremberg that Grossraum was a purely academic theory was nonsense, much in the same way that Lenny Riefenstahl's claim to have been an apolitical artist uh, was also the rankest nonsense. Banned from teaching, his teaching, sorry, banned from teaching for his refusal to undergo denazification, Schmidt nonetheless exerted a deep influence on a broad swath of post-war German and European conservatives. His post-war reception on the left uh, was more modest. In Germany, his reputation was augmented among conservatives who sensed that he had been made a, scape a scapegoat for sins others had gotten away with. Certainly, many were not, de were not banned from teaching. Many Nazis were not banned from teaching. Uh, and among some left radicals who saw in any enemy of conservative restorationist post-war Germany a claim to be a hero. Ellen Kennedy, a political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, is one of the leading figures in the American Schmidt Renaissance. In a recent autobiographical reflection, Kennedy writes that in her student years in the mid-1970s, only the concept of the political was translated into English and there was a single monograph on Schmidt. Quote, neither I nor most of my political theory colleagues in England had heard of Carl Schmidt. Historians of Germany knew more about Schmidt and Weimar, but few had read him. 30 years later, English language scholarship on Schmidt is ubiquitous in numerous fields, uh, from political theory to intellectual history, constitutional law and cultural studies, and his name carries a radical cachet among left or left-ish intellectuals 
in the post 9-11 era. What accounts for the explosion of interest in this figure with this very unsavory uh, biography? In the mid-1980s, the constellations which had long fixed Schmidt's reputation began to shift. Schmidt began to be canonized as a classic of political theory at the same moment that a disoriented American left discovered him. The American journal Telos, long oriented to Western Marxist traditions, published a special issue in 1987, introducing Carl Schmidt with the following words. Why Schmidt? Why now? What's a nice leftist journal like Telos doing in an intellectual dive like this? Their answer, because of, quote, because of his past, many on the left prefer to ignore Schmidt altogether. But why should the left shrink from learning from its opponents? Schmidt's ideas throw much needed light on questions central to the so-called crisis of the left. It is for this reason that Schmidt should be read carefully but against the grain, since the profundity of his thought is matched only by the intensity of his conservatism. There were other signs of burgeoning academic interest in the 1980s too. The first English language biography of Schmidt appeared in 1983, and translations of two of Schmidt's major works first appeared in 1985. The Schmidt revival of the last quarter century thus preceded the collapse of the Soviet bloc, but was greatly intensified by it. Uh, from, that emerged both military, from that emerged both military unipolarity and the acceleration of economic globalization. Without the friend-foe polarity that had defined world politics for four decades, some thinkers worried about the dissolution of the world into a formless space. For some, the emergence of a US-led neoliberal trade order under Bush and Clinton was the real stum stimulus to the discovery of Schmidt. For others, the war on terror was the real turning point. If, if the end of the actual Cold War was one source of the Schmidt Renaissance, the reappearance of mentalities reminiscent of the Cold War lent both plausibility and radical cachet to the interpretation of Schmidt as nonpartisan realist, a social scientist alert to the human penchant to divide societies into us and them, or the powerful to accept themselves from the rules of the game. In short, the pulling up of one of the symbolic anchors of the 20th century's political imagination was disorienting. New paradigms were sought by the left, and Schmidt became a candidate. A major landmark in the Schmidt Renaissance was an international conference hosted by Columbia in 1999 on Schmidt's legacy and prospects, and the organizers described their quest in the following way. Quote, from a vilified thinker once simply reduced to his role as crown jurist of the Third Reich, Schmidt is now increasingly recognized as a highly controversial classic of contemporary legal and political thought, a fertile source for rethinking current issues and debates. To proponents of the Schmidt Renaissance, like Ellen Kennedy, Tracy Strong, and Paul Kahn, <clears throat> the new attention to Schmidt is justified by two divergent claims. First, that he is particularly relevant to our moment, and paradoxically, uh, second, paradoxically, a timeless classic only now getting its due. To Kennedy, the quote, ultimate explanation for the Schmidt Renaissance is that the post-Cold War, Cold War world, quote, offers more, not fewer political choices than the bipolar globe it replaced. It resembles more the pattern of European politics between the wars when liberal ideas and institutions were besieged by various political movements hostile to liberalism. Writing in 1996, Tracy Strong suggests that Schmidt is a classic because he addresses central questions which any contemporary political theorist must consider, such as the relationship between liberalism and democracy, politics and ethics, and the importance of what Schmidt called enemies for state legitimation. Yale Law School's Paul Kahn authored Political Theology, Four New Chapters on Sovereignty in 2011. <clears throat> 
And there, Kahn swiftly brackets the historical Schmidt at the price, in my view, of turning his texts into classics, even works of art. Of course, he writes, Schmidt wrote against a background of pressing local concerns. So do we. But then so did Plato, Aristotle, and every other philosopher, whose achievement was to gain a freedom of thought within those circumstances. This is the attitude with which we must approach Schmidt's work. It is the same attitude with which we approach any creative work. This is not an excuse for Schmidt's politics, which were inexcusable. Rather, the point is that no excuse is needed to engage the work. No excuses are necessary because Schmidt, according to Kahn, because Schmidt gives us precious insights into the deficiencies of liberal political theory as a description of the modern polity. He calls it a mode of descriptive political analysis of the social imaginary of the political. Schmidt enables us to access the experience of the political as something beyond the liberal state's self-presentation as an efficient means of advancing individual welfare. <clears throat> Schmidt's political theology illuminates the conditions of, quote, an American superpower that simultaneously asks its young people to take up the burden of sacrifice in the war on terror and seeks to affirm its belief in the rule of law. While liberal theory has given us tools to understand the rule of law, it has pushed out of sight the meaning of political sacrifice. We can study liberal political theory a very long time and never find this existential moment of self-sacrifice. If, pol if politics remains even in part a practice of sacrifice, then we must follow Schmidt into this domain of the theological. Must we? The positions of Kennedy, Strong, and Kahn described above, described above together represent a sea change in Schmidt's American reputation. In the 1940s and 50s, the prominence of German Jewish emigres in the social sciences erected a kind of taboo zone around Schmidt's writings. To appreciate the novelty of Schmidt's recent canonization, consider the reaction of Harvard Law School's Detlev Wacht to the Schmidt Renaissance launched at Columbia in 1999. The emigres as a group treated Schmidt as an adversary, for he had said of them, for Schmidt had said of them, that Germany had spat them out forever. He appeared to them as a thinker whose work had undermined the legitimacy of parliamentary democracy and had prepared the way for Hitler's arrival at power. They saw him as enthusiastically adapted to the demands of the new forces after 1933, justifying its departures from legality and resort to violence. What they did not do was treat him as a classic. The taboo on reading Schmidt has eroded with the passing of the emigre generation and our increasing temporal distance from the Third Reich and the Holocaust. With his recent canonization nearly complete, Schmidt has achieved his post-war goal, to be ranked with the thinkers he likened himself to, Machiavelli uh, and Hobbes. For the historically minded of his proponents, a respectful, even reverential handling of Schmidt's corpus represents the beginning of an object objective assessment of a figure long obscured by emotional reactions. Restored to the interwar context of their significance, Schmidt's writings of the 1920s should not be read, they argue, as prefigurations of his choices in 1933. Schmidt's Nazism should no longer prejudice our appreciation of a complex and profound body of work because his choices were contingent and not necessary. There is no fascist core to Schmidt's thought. In sum, for the left political theorists who have adopted Schmidt as their inspiration, or with a nod to older left taboos, the thinker, they say, who is most valuable to think with, the historical Schmidt is mostly irrelevant. Uh, and this sense of entitlement to read Schmidt ahistorically has arrived because professional scholars 
have already done their due diligence in excavating the depths of Schmidt's anti-Semitism and his complicity with the Nazi state. Uh, that is, they feel, that they feel entitled by this, uh, by this historical work that has been done. But there is still something deeply, un deeply unsettling to me about accounts of Schmidt which seek to normalize him by em emphasizing the prominence or liberal credentials of his interlocutors uh, or to assert his relevance to the most perennial or most pressing political issues. In short, uh, as one author uh, has, has described it, to refine Schmidt into a classic. And this raises for me the question, what, what have we in the academy generally gained from Schmidt's newfound respectability? And for the left specifically, what has been gained and what has been lost in Schmidt's shift from taboo to totem? In 2008, political theorist Andres Kalavas published uh, Democracy and the Politics of the Extraordinary, Max Weber, Carl Schmidt, Hannah Arendt. Kalavas attempts to cordon off the post-1933 theorists for the Reich, insisting on the, huge, on the, quote, huge differences between Schmidt's political legal theory and the politics of the Nazi party, unquote. Um, Kalavas writes that Schmidt was, quote, captivated by the genuine capacity of the groundless creative power of the multitude, the unformed form of all forms to create, the unformed power of all forms to create order out of chaos, unquote. Now to be sure, Kalivas wants us to note that there is a less familiar Schmidt who was, quote, equally attentive to the multitude's need for self-limitation, that is, to the second or ordinary face of democratic politics, unquote. But the major objective of his book is to emphasize the creative power in extraordinary moments of democratic politics. And so Kalavas's project is to elaborate uh, on Schmidt as a democratic theorist uh, who, quote, relies upon and further develops Schmidt's attempt to extricate constitutionalism from the liberal tradition in order to take it in a more democratic direction. So uh, Schmidt, as a critic of liberal constitutionalism, empowers or enables Kalevas to, to come up with a theory of more democratic uh, constitutionalism. Um, at the level of abstraction at which he reads him, Kalevas argues that Schmidt's theory of democratic politics quote, shares some remarkable similarities with Bruce Ackerman's theorist of dualist democracy, the notion that politics divides into two different ideal typical phases, that of higher lawmaking uh, and normal lawmaking. Obscured, therefore, is the centrality to Schmidt's system of what Kalevas anodynely names Schmidt's, quote, authoritarian preferences, unquote. Um, I think I'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, perhaps it is conventional for some political theorists to read Schmidt at such a high level of abstraction that, that he may bracket something as fundamental as Schmidt's rejection of pluralism, but to claim, as Kalevas does, that this is what Schmidt really meant is contradicted by the findings of intellectual history. Kalavas argues that too much ink has been wasted over Schmidt's alleged glorification of substance, homogeneity, identity. What he advocated was much more prosaic and commonsensical, that democracy can only exist in the movement toward the elimination of political inequalities and the removal of the distance between rulers and ruled. Given what intellectual historian Raphael Gross and others have discovered about the depth of Schmidt's investments in a specifically ethno-national form of homogeneity, namely the Aryan-German one cleansed of Jewish membership, it is very difficult to stomach Kalevas's claim that Schmidt's requirement that democracies be homogeneous 
is only common sense. In the year 2000, a member of the New Left Review editorial board, intellectual historian Gopal Balakrishnan, published the first English language intellectual biography of Schmidt in over a decade. Schmidt warranted serious critical engagement by leftists concerned about the quality and depth of liberal democracy and the problem of empire in international relations. Like Kalavas, Balakrishnan elaborates, arguing that Schmidt's emphasis on the foundational power of the sovereign people, the pouvoir constituant, is therapeutic for today's left. Balakrishnan reads Schmidt through a Gramscian lens, um, arguing that Schmidt's conception of homogeneity has no intrinsic ethno-national meaning. Instead, what homogeneity really meant to Schmidt was, quote, the minimal threshold of political unity between which the people dissolves into warring parties, each claiming to represent the whole. So he turns uh, Schmidt into a theorist of, of hegemony, mapping the friend-enemy distinction onto uh, class, class distinctions. But do we really need Schmidt to tell us what Gramsci can already? For Balakrishnan, the drift towards centrist politics in Clinton and Blair was one example of the kind of depoliticization that must be resisted, as well as the left split over the 1999 NATO intervention in Yugoslavia's civil war. Quote, Schmidt's relevance to commentary on international relations should be readily apparent since his polemics capture the vaguely Kafkaesque ring of a jargon which declares war between states to be abolished and invokes the highest ideals of humanity to justify police operations and sanctions against outlaw governments, unquote. Balakrishnan has in mind the famous passages in the concept of the political in which Schmidt articulated his revanchism against the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, formulations which have an understandable appeal to those on the left sensitive to the paradoxes of humanitarian intervention and perpetual war. Uh, so to quote from Schmidt's 1927 uh, text, when a state fights its political enemy in the name of humanity, it is not a war for the sake of humanity, but a war wherein a particular state seeks to usurp a universal concept against its opponent. It tries to identify itself with humanity in the same way that one can misuse peace, justice, progress, and civilization. And here one is reminded of Proudhon, whoever invokes humanity wants to cheat. And those are some passages which have become particularly, particularly um, attractive to uh, to, to members of the left uh, today. And I think for, there's, for, for under, understandable reasons. Leftists have therefore discovered a passing affinity between Carl Schmitt's ressentiment against Wilsonian moralism and their own frustrations with the moralistic hubris of the sole remaining superpower and have mistaken the affinity of the moment for a trans-historical truth about what I take to be a mythological abstraction, uh, the political. He who aspires to realism in international affairs has no need of Carl Schmitt. Okay, now lastly, I'll talk about Chantal Mouffe very briefly. In a plethora of books and articles written between 1991 and 2008, Chantal Mouffe argues that Carl Schmitt is the most relevant and profound theorist of democracy and pluralism for our time. Like Balakrishnan, Mouffe considers Schmidt's writings especially timely tools for resisting the depoliticization that she sees in politics since the end of the Cold War. Quote, the concept of the political was originally published in 1932. Actually, she's wrong about that. It's 1927. Uh, but Schmidt's critique is more relevant now than ever. If we examine the evolution of liberal thought since then, we ascertain that it has indeed moved between economics and ethics, unquote. For Mouffe, Schmidt's concept of the political seems as relevant to the contest between different models of democracy in the academy. Uh, she's thinking of the deliberative 
dem democracy model that she sees in Rawls and Habermas versus the aggregative interest model, uh, as it is to the projection of US power in the post-Cold War world. Neoliberal economic policies, on the one hand, accompanied, accompanied by moralistic deployments of state violence on the other. Can a theory that dovetails so well with contemporary discourses be prudently neglected, let alone tabooed? She distills Schmidtian insights into sweeping trans-historical generalizations. Quote, by the political, I refer to the dimension of antagonism that is inherent in all human society. Politics consists in trying to diffuse the potential antagonism that exists. All politics creates an us by determination of a them. Agonistic politics does not try to overcome it through discussion or deliberation, a la Rawls or Habermas, but to recognize the legitimate adversary." Unquote. So like Kalavas, Mouffe does her due diligence, making all the necessary caveats about Schmidt's professional choices personal prejudices and political intentions, but insists that a theorist's use of Schmidt, thus koshered, should be uncontroversial. Quote, I would have thought everybody should be able to understand that it is possible to use Schmidt against Schmidt, to use his insights into the critique of liberalism in order to consolidate liberalism, while recognizing that, of course, this was not his aim. Now, Mouffe's claim that one can use Schmidt to strengthen or consolidate liberal democracy is truly bizarre. And Mouffe equivocates between rejecting liberalism, uh, unconsciously equivocates between rejecting liberalism and claiming to consolidate it. Uh, in place of de deliberative democracy, she offers her agonistic politics, a theory which she claims reconciles essential Schmidtian insights with the pluralism of modern multicultural societies. But on closer scrutiny, I would argue, her new understanding merely utilizes Schmidt's transgressive vocabulary to redescribe the agonistic political practice uh, long conventional to all Western uh, democracies. Mouffe argues that the model common to Rawls and Habermas denies, devalues, or underestimates the centrality of antagonism in human society and politics, and offers an illusory fantasy of rational consensus in its place. But transforming potentially violent antagonisms into manageable agonisms is hardly a novel idea. Consider the Federalist Papers. But Mouffe believes uh, that the Academy uh, enchanted with Rawls and Habermas needs reminding of this. Um, when we accept, uh, as, she, as she writes, when we accept that every consensus exists as a temporary result of a provisional hegemony and that always entails some form of exclusion, we can begin to envision the public sphere in a new way an approach that reveals the impossibility of establishing a consensus without exclusion is of fundamental importance for democratic politics because it keeps the democratic contestation alive. And here, Mouffe runs into a contradiction. If the key advantage of her understanding of democratic pluralism is that it foregrounds rather than camouf camouflages the exclusions that result from every consensus impl implemented, then why does she restrict the field of democratic contestation to those who agree on the ground rules of democracy in the first place? And this is apparent in her definition of the adversary as, quote, a legitimate enemy, an enemy with whom we have in common a shared adhesion to the ethico-political principles of democracy. So she really wants to have it uh, both ways. So. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Mouffe's description of international relations mimics her description of politics within nation states. The common denominator is her commitment to what she calls agonistic pluralism. In Schmidt's vision of a multipolar world order, an essay, Mouffe applies insights she finds in Schmidt's 
1950 nomos of the earth to challenge the hegemony of the United States in its quote unquote unipolar moment. Quote, the central problem that our current unipolar world is facing it is, is that it is impossible for antagonisms to find legitimate forms of expression. It is no wonder then that those antagonisms, when they emerge, take extreme forms, unquote. Um, Mouffe acknowledges that Al-Qaeda's terrorism has multiple sources, but she gives pride of place to neoliberal globalization under an American aegis. And she, she sums up by saying, to create the channels for legitimate expression of dissent, we need to envision a pluralistic world order constructed around a certain number of great spaces uh, and cultural uh, poles. Uh, in my view, Mouffe's error recapitulates Balakrishnan's. Uh, in the name of anti-imperialism, a preemptive strike is made against the cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism with which it is conflated, and all that remains is classical realism's balance of power, now rewarmed and served a la Schmidt. So there's an interesting beeping sound. That's, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> while Habermas and an older generation of leftist intellectuals emphasize the continuities in Schmidt's pre-1933 and post-1933 thought, Balakrishnan, Kalivas, and Mouffe assert a clear break. Intellectual historical argument is today used as much to justify one's appropriations of Schmidt as it is to anchor one's aversions. While Mouffe and Kalavas go so far as to claim that Schmidt's Weimar writings were intended to save the Republic, most accept the consensus view of historians that Schmidt aimed with his texts to sharpen the contradictions between liberalism and democracy and thereby shorten the Republic's life. The new left Schmidtians therefore use intellectual history when it favors them and dismiss it as irrelevant when it does not. Uh, most established their bona fides by acknowledging Schmidt's personal failures, so-called personal failures of political judgment, but imply that these choices are contingencies of the life, not the motivating life worlds of the thought. It was not for nothing that Schmidt was subject to a lifelong ban on teaching from 1945 to his death. But the genie is out of the bottle. Hopefully the frisson that has attached to his name for so long will dissipate, and with it the romantic aura of danger and radical promise. In 1985, the political scientist Kurt Sontheimer eulogized Schmidt in these words. He who cares about liberal democracy has no need of Carl Schmidt, unquote. Neither Schmidt's critiques of liberalism nor the pathos with which he invested his dichotomies of friend and enemy, norm and decision, legality and legitimacy, do much to advance the traditional values of the Western left. Autonomy and emancipation, liberty and equality, democracy, the critique of capitalism, imperialism, and solidarity with the oppressed. To put a left spin on Sontheimer, I would add, that he who cares about a democratic left cannot afford to tarry with Schmidt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew. This was wonderful. Um, questions? This is the gentleman down left. And would you present yourself, please? I'm Solomon Burnett. Um, all right, so appropriation of Nazi thought is a regular thing, right? Operation Paperclip, whereby Nazi technologies and sciences were transferred into the US and whatnot. I, part and parcel of this process was a recruitment of Nazi academics you know, um, into Western spaces. I was wondering if um, Schmidt was recruited in any way. Secondarily, if it was not necessarily politically efficacious to 
overtly appropriate Schmidtian thought in post-war constitutional endeavors. Um, do you see any crypto Schmidtian manifestations in Western legalism post-World War II? Um, I, I, I'm not aware of any efforts of the CIA to recruit uh, 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 Carl Schmidt. Um, I was wondering whether the Western Academy mobilizing Schmidt now this way. Whether the, the, the equivalent, he was likening the Western Academy use of Schmidt right now to the CIA mobilization. Yeah. Yeah. No, I. I, um, I mean, yes, there, there. Are, I would say there are crypto Schmidtian elements in uh, the theorizing of the national security state throughout the Cold War period. Kissinger is uh, Kissinger would be, for example, who uh, is quite influenced uh, uh, by Schmidt. Um, but uh, uh, no explicit effort to, to, to enlist him as a thinker, and, and for the reason that he was, that he, that, that he was seen as toxic and, and uh, unusable in, in many respects. So, thank you. James? Um, uh, I'm James Chapel. I teach um, modern European history at Duke. Um, I have, you know, maybe there are remarks, maybe there are questions. Um, I was wondering about sort of, so, I mean, you said a number of times that, I mean, it seems central to your argument. I'm sure you exp expound more on this in the longer version of this. I was wondering if you could say very, I don't know, maybe briefly, I, I thought I'd hear more of it in the paper, um, what precisely you see as so objectionable in the Smith of the 1920s? Because if you, if you take the friend-enemy distinction and you say that Balakrishnan is, um, it's unjust for him to read this into a class distinction, if that's true, it's also unjust of you to read it as a race distinction, because he says explicitly that it's not about race in that, in that book. So I just wonder, you know, and you, someone like Kalibas, I mean, he's read, in that, in that book, he was basing, you know, he's talking about one chapter in constitutional theory. And it is, and it's at least textually true, that Smith is, is Schmidt is very interested in defending democracy. That's the point of a lot of his books in the 1920s. So is are you, I mean, I don't know. Is it, so I was wondering is sort of, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem so obvious to me that the Schmidt of the 1920s is um, a sort of proto, is, is like obviously a proto-national socialist. And so I just wonder like which aspect of this thought you were kind of um, referencing there. Like the idea of a friend-enemy distinction does not lead obviously to Nazism, you know, and he, so, and the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is maybe a comment, is like the issue of, a, of Schmidt as a classic, especially at Columbia, I found that very interesting, um, as to whether Schmidt is a classic and what that is, because it seems to say a lot less about Schmidt and more about what we mean by classic, and I just wonder sort of what you meant by that or what you think about that, because it seems really interesting to me because you think about the way that our canon of what we think of to be the classics as formed at a place like Columbia or at a place like Chicago is precisely as a narrative that's created to justify the very liberal democratic order that Schmidt was trying to subvert. So to call him a classic is you know, really interesting and subversive. Um, so I just wonder, if, is he really being called a classic? Because he was, in fact, being taught in the classics when I was there. Um, so, okay, that's all. Yeah, no, thank you very much for, for pushing back on the, on the 1920s. I mean, that is, that is the rub. That is what uh, the, the left, you know, the, the, that is what there, there are, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't, there's, the quality of scholarship is very high. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's fundamentally mistaken, but, you know, Balakrishnan is a serious historian. Kalavas is a major political theorist who is on the editorial board of Constellations, which is a very important, um, very important journal. So I, um, you know, but but um, I think that that the, you know, sure, the the, the friend enemy distinction um, could be taken, you know, in a could be could be taken in a left uh, uh, direction, but. Um, uh, I mean, that's also that's also very much valorizing a very extreme conception of politics, um, in which, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I just think I think it's it's sort of, 
elevating a sort of trivial insight into the, the, the agonistic nature of politics into, uh, you know, that we can get something special out of, you know, a, a very, very close study of Carl Schmitt to understand that there are, you know, that there are sides in, in, in politics. Um, I mean, for, it, 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 it's such an extreme uh, reduction of what politics is. Politics is not only uh, the, um, the determination, of the, the, the clear-sightedness about who your enemy is. Um, and, and in terms of what's wrong with the, the 20s, I think, I mean, you know, you, if you read the Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy, it's filled with these really encomiums to, to, to fascism. Uh, if, you, if you look at political theology, it, this stuff about the, the norm and the exception is, uh, again, kind of making a fetish of, uh, you know, the extraordinary moments, and and I think I think it reflects uh, something, you know, kind of some of the Nietzschean, uh, uh, the Nietzschean and Heideggerian uh, uh, ambiance of the 1920s. I don't I don't think that uh, these texts are, um, you know, part of the the canon of. of should be part of the canon of of of, of a democratic left. Uh, Theory and as for, as for your, your comment about the the, the classics, um, you I mean you I guess it's I guess it's it would be an unusual classic in the sense that it doesn't it doesn't contribute to the canon in the way that other you know the sort of the the the, the affirmation of liberal democracy, uh, so, but that but that doesn't mean that people aren't calling it trying to make it into a classic. Uh, so yes, people do refer to it as a classic. Um, and, and my objection to that is that it seems to um, uh, both, you know, sort of ratify Schmidt's own personal goals, but more importantly, um, I think what I'm what I'm struggling with is that there are a lot of people out there who think Schmidt is a, is a thinker of the first rank, and I'm not one of them. And so it's sort of like, um, so for example. You know, one could say a lot of the things that I, I say about Nietzsche and Heidegger, but I'm but I would not dismiss Nietzsche and Heidegger in the same way, right? Nietzsche and Heidegger make contributions to epistemology and metaphysics in ways that Schmidt does not. So for me, Schmidt is more of a symptomatic, you know, mid twentieth century right wing uh, theorist who, who, whose, whose contributions don't really transcend uh, their time. And you know that's that's why I object to sort of the elevation of him to this sort of genius font of genius that will be you know repays endless uh, uh, study and and uh, yeah but 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 that that is the rub I mean I think mo a lot of people think he is a thinker of the first rank. Uh, Emily, Hi, I'm Emily Levine, and uh, I'm in the history department at UNC Greensboro. Thank you, Matthew, for your um, really uh, probing talk. And I think you make a really compelling and persuasive case that um, I've been grasping to be able to make, and I think, you know, I'm grateful for your <laughs> sort of doing it on my behalf, but I think what you really show is that um, the left uh, salvages these uh, usable moments of Schmidt's uh, life work. Um, really only um, at um, um, by diluting them um, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where they almost seem not to resemble the original uh, work itself and the couple of examples that you that you use in which you know the, the terms that are picked up and sort of more I mean to think of Bruce Ackerman as being somehow like a like a Schmidian thinker I mean it just seems almost it seems so far-fetched I mean and if antagonism is what we take from Schmidt, well, I mean, antagonism is in Rousseau, it's in Kant, I mean, his very opposite. I mean, it seems to me that, mm -hmm. that, um, um, there, that, that the, the, the reason for uh, appropriating Schmidt becomes um, reduced to rhetoric. And I guess I wonder if you could say something about, you know, what, a little bit more about what, what exactly do you see the appeal as I mean, you talked a little bit about the, sure. his, the shift happening, yeah. you know, from the Cold War to the Bush era, um, but it but it seems to me that that the sort of taboo of invoking a former Nazi to support mm. um, sort of leftist ideas is what is really 
um, at, at issue here and what is seen as the benefit. And that to me, I mean, that to me seems to reduce this whole effort really, I mean, debase this effort, um, you know, of the, of the left. Um, if what it really is is sort of for shock value, you know. Uh, no, I, that's, a, those are, that's a good, uh, that's an interesting hypothesis. Hypothesis. I, I don't read it that way. I don't, I don't think that it's, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the motivation is to shock. I think, I think the motivation uh, for Schmidt is that, first of all, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very seductive writer. He's a very good writer. Um, he, um, and, he's, and he has, he's, he, some of his most famous phrases are epigrams. And so they have a kind of seductive quality. They get repeated. They become fashionable. Um, um, uh, but, you know, like, like Heidegger and like other, some other thinkers, there's, there's a kind of um, forbidding and uh, incantatory quality to, you know, mis there's a mystery about his prose. What does he really mean? That invites, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, apprenticeship, right? So I, I, I think, I, I would say that there's a combination of this sort of seduction and a sense that these, the broad contours of these ideas are relevant to a moment of depoliticization when, you know, the American the hegemon, you know, kind of stands uh, un uncontested. Uh, but I'll, I'll have to think more about that, whether, whether uh, you know, I, I, I think my argument is that all of these left Schmidians sort of tr try to claim that they've done their due diligence and that they understand that Schmidt is a Nazi and so they're trying to exercise that uh, shock. I don't think they're trying to, to um, use that shock value. They're trying to, to, to make it through the fire. But, 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 but uh, that's an interesting... Um, One final question. Thank you, Matthew. It was really interesting. And uh, actually, I agree with most of what you said. But uh, I would like you to comment briefly on, on two uh, uh, like traits that I see going on here. It's one is the historical one, right? Historical context is relevant when we look at uh, you know, authors like Smith or Heidegger, or, right? Uh, and, and then uh, you, you talk about this highly abstract way to look at it from now. But, but there are historical contexts, too, that is relevant, right? And mm -hmm. uh, you were giving a great timeline in, in, in the moment in the 80s in which the, la the new left will try to start dealing with this media. Mm -hmm. but, but you just mentioned something about the, the aftermath of 9-11, uh, uh, right, that I will, I will argue that will be the most interesting historical context to re bring back uh, from the left uh, such, a, such a thinker. Then is one the issue of, of, of historicity and context uh, uh, that I think is clear, but it will be great to, to have more on that. And the second is, is, a, is a critique on, on contemporary political thought and you know the fetishization of, of, the, of the use uh, as a fetish of, of authors like Schmidt or uh, other authors uh, of the early 20th century. Uh, because this is a critique of the academia, uh, somehow, mm -hmm. the, the one that you are doing, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, will, I will like more on that, uh, because it's, it's, mm. it's very interesting to, to, to tackle, uh, you mm. know, uh, specific authors, the most important ones now in, in the, in, in the uh, left uh, uh, political uh, 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 thinking process in, in the US at least. Uh, or in the West, Mufle and Calabas, uh, about that critique of intellectual uh, political thought. Yeah, so why, the, why does the left do it? What's in it for them? What's in it for the left? Well, I mean, it's. <clears throat> I mean, the, the the short answer is, uh, you know, the the, exha the exhaustion the exhaustion of Marxism and the search the search for a a a, a, a robust anti-liberal yes. uh, tradition, tradition of, of, of thought. Um, and then I think, um, so that's sort of the big picture, and then I think the, 
there, there's a, a more specific answer to the post 9-11 moment where, um, you know, because I think the, the Bush administration behaved in ways that were, uh, uh, that, that, that lent themselves to, uh, uh, the, you know, a Schmidtian interpretation, but to, but, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the good guys and the terrorists and, and the, so so people thought okay I'm, I I get something here but uh, but to take that I mean maybe the Bush administration were Schmidtian but that doesn't mean we have to be Schmidtian too. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much, Monsieur Professor Spector, and uh, we'll think about having something on Schmidt perhaps next year by way of a workshop or a conference that may build up on your insight.